Hello, everybody. Again, thank you for joining me. My name is Andrea Locke, and I am the coordinator for Western New Prism, a partnership for regional and race management. We cover the eight westernmost counties in New York State and represent uh, one of eight partnerships in the prison network. Prism provides leadership, coordination, and information for their leaders and more on invasive species management across the board. Uh, everything from planning, information, education, prevention, early detection, removal, and, and certainly habitat restoration. The Prism Network is a great example of that cooperation and collaboration uh, and demonstrates the use of that effective integrated approach to invasive species management. Uh, we benefit greatly here in New York State from the statewide coverage and the long-term commitment that we do have from the state. If you're not familiar with the Prism Network, then I, I strongly recommend that you take some time to check out the various websites. There are a lot of great resources available, so definitely check out. Uh, we're here today to talk about birds and invasive species, and I'm assuming that everybody is clear on what a bird is, no issues there. On the other hand, uh, there can be some ambiguity surrounding what an invasive species is. So to ensure that we're all on the same page, this is how we define an invasive species. An invasive species is one that is non-native to the ecosystem under consideration and whose introduction causes or is likely to cause economic or environmental harm or harm to human health. An invasive species has to be non-native and it has to cause harm. And that harm is measurable. There are many non-native species that don't cause harm and more than a few native species that do. I generally refer to these as weeds or pests if you're talking about something other than a plant. So as you can see here, the impacts of invasive species are wide-ranging, everything from agriculture and recreation to the loss of biodiversity that many of us are familiar with, as well as those impacts both direct and indirect as far as human health. So I think I was going to start here, but uh, I would be remiss if I didn't talk a little bit about some of our invasive birds. In 2015, uh, the Washington Post published an article called The Dirty Dozen, uh, it is a list of the 12 most destructive invasive animals in the United States. And this was based mostly on economic damage, but there's also some ecological damage addressed in this article as well. As you can see right there on the list is the European starling, one of our most common birds. The European starling was introduced in 1890 in Central Park by the American Acclimatization Society. Their goal was to introduce European flora and fauna to North America, and this not so noble effort ended up focusing on basically gifting every bird ever mentioned in a Shakespeare play to the rest of the world. And now European starlings can be found on six of the seven continents. Probably not a surprise that Antarctica is the only one left out. We have over 200 million starlings in North America, and each bird may eat as much as four ounces of seed per day. You can see there that just 10,000 starlings can consume as much as one and a quarter tons of cattle feed at an estimated annual loss of $100 million to the U.S. agriculture uh, commodities. So starlings have also been shown to carry and transmit diseases, including meningitis, bacteria, seven different forms of encephalitis, and they all compete native birds for habitat and resources. In one species, if you think back to the definition of invasive species, uh, we've already hit the trifecta of harm, economic, environmental, and human health. So there are nearly 100 non-native bird species in North America with self-sustaining populations, and that's the basic metric that we use to determine if a species is established. It needs to escape into the wild, and it needs to have that self-sustaining uh, wild population. Some of these are game birds, such as the ringneck pheasant, or escaped pets like lovebirds, or the starlings and house sparrows, you know, released by the Step Pet Sea Society. Not all of these are like European starlings in that they're found everywhere. Many are geographically restricted, such as the monk parakeet found in Florida and the southeast, the red crown parrot in California, and some species may be invasive in some regions, but not necessarily others. Again, we have to think back to the definition, the need to cause harm, and its association to particular habitat types. Something like the cattle egret, which was first recorded in Florida in the 1950s, it's not native to North America, but it's also not an invasive species. It's just here and pretty cool birds to boot. So the estimated cost associated to non-native birds, so this is including non-native and invasive, so it's not making a distinction in this particular instance. But that is $2 billion annually. 
Here's some of our other common invasive birds. We have house sparrows, mute swans, and the ringneck pheasant. House sparrows were introduced to New York City in 1850, and by 1910 had spread to California. And house sparrows coexist so readily with humans. They tend to hang out in nests in unfortunate places like gutters, uh, blocking them and causing damage. They're also aggressive towards other birds. Mute swans are, are pretty devastating. Uh, they have a major threat to ecosystems. They're, they're very aggressive and territorial. They force native waterfowl out of areas. They forage heavily on native plants and compete uh, with native species for food and habitat. Uh, they primarily forage on submerged vegetation and use their feet to, to basically kick that up and unseat it. They can eat four to eight pounds per day. But kind of worse than that is that, you know, when they're dislodging all of these plants, they only actually eat about half of it. So it's kind of like you making dinner and then randomly throwing out half of your meal into the garden and not letting anybody else have some. We do have native swans. We have uh, trumpeter swans, although they're, they're rare in this area. The tundra swans do migrate through. They're pretty easy to tell apart, too, especially uh, with the adults, because our the mute swans have that orange-yellow bill, while our native swans are more black. Invasive birds are, are disproportionately the cause of disease transmission and other nuisance issues, probably having to do with the fact that they tend to live in closer proximity to humans. So it isn't that certain invasive birds are able to transmit diseases that other birds aren't. It's more that they're just living alongside us uh, much more readily. Um, and, there, and there you see in Hawaii, invasive birds have facilitated the spread of mosquito-borne diseases. Kind of an interesting side note on Hawaii, there are no native mosquitoes to Hawaii. So even mosquitoes are invasive in Hawaii. They were first introduced in 1826. And so you can see here too, uh, you know, more agricultural impact of uh, invasive birds here, the fecal contamination. Uh, and this is, this is a really high concern. And you want to think back to that $2 billion of agricultural damage annually. So in, in 2015, New York State Invasive Species Regulation Part 575 Prohibited and regulated species went into effect. The mute swan uh, is prohibited in New York State. As such, may not be bought, sold, traded, moved, or otherwise introduced. The others here, uh, from left to right, are the Muscovy duck, the Egyptian goose, and the monk parakeet. These are not prohibited, but they're regulated, which does allow people to buy them, uh, but it's mostly as pets for is other kind of domesticated animals. As regulated species, it's illegal to introduce them to a free living state or knowingly put them somewhere where they could be introduced to a free living state. So I just talked about mute swans just a minute ago, and mute swans being pretty darn catastrophic. Uh, but the Muscovy ducks are prolific. They form dense populations. They damage property, transmit disease. They also interbreed with native species. The Egyptian goose is Aggressive, they often see species, field nests, and then similar to the Muscovy ducks, they form dense populations and are pretty destructive. The monk kept parakeets are interesting. They're a bit of a scourge in the southeast where they build large nests of sticks on electrical utilities, uh, causing short circuits and brownouts. But uh, that was my, my quick run through on some of the invasive birds that we have. Now I'd, I'd like to talk about other invasive species and how they impact our native birds. I'm going to make the case, and, and hopefully a, a convincing one, uh, that invasive species have a serious negative impact on birds. First, just, you know, a couple of basics on ecology. Ecosystems with healthy native plant communities improve water and air quality, decrease erosion, function as carbon sink, provide food and habitat for wildlife, and provide additional ecosystem services. Ecosystem services are those kind of inherent qualities of ecosystems that provide or improve or otherwise make human life possible. Things like the water quality and air quality, but also thinking about insects and pollination. Those are all ecosystem services. In other words, healthy native ecosystems support life. They support human life, they support bird life, they support insect life. And so here we have photos, you know, one depicting a healthy forest uh, with canopy trees, mid-story trees, shrubs, the robust Raised flare, you know, there's a lot of diversity in just that one photo. And then looking at the, the second photo, where, you know, what you have are a limited number of tree species, limited age diversity. They're all 
being the same age. And then you have an understory of 100% Japanese barberry. So just looking at those two photos, you can very easily see the difference between a healthy system versus one that has been uh, overtaken by invasive species. So invasive species come in and they cause all this havoc. They cause loss of biodiversity, loss of structural diversity, loss of habitat, and loss of that ecosystem function. When we're going out and walking, um, taking a hike around western New York now, you know, many of our forests, they, they pretty much look the same, and they really shouldn't. Western New York has a diversity of habitats that it has lots of different communities and structural diversity. We think of forests and, and woodlands as having 100% canopy color, but this isn't really accurate. There really should be a lot more of that structural diversity, meaning, you know, we should have breaks in the canopy that allow for that healthy herbaceous community to thrive. And so in many places in western New York, we've almost completely lost some of that herbaceous community, that ground layer of diverse grasses, sedges, ferns, flowers. And so here you see, again, some of the diversity of uh, habitats that we have here in western New York versus what tends to happen when we see increased disturbance and increased invasive species. We see less of that herbaceous layer. And then in areas where we don't have a canopy, we start to see monocultures of other species, in, in this case, red mites. And when we start to relate this to birds, you know, one of the most imperiled category of birds in North America and in the world are those ground nesting birds. And they really need that herbaceous diversity um, in order to survive. I love this chart. It comes from the Conservation Research Institute. And it shows root systems of prairie plants. And yes, prairie, we're not prairie here. So most of the species identified on the chart are actually native to Western New York. And I can't read that, and that's okay. You'll just have to take my word for it. But what it does show is thinking back to that structural diversity and ecosystem services, is the structure of our native habitat starts with the upper canopy. It doesn't stop at the surface of the soil. It continues into the soil. The healthy soil is also an important aspect of ecosystem health and therefore ecosystems' ability to support life. And so what's really interesting about this diagram is that if you look all the way over there on the left, that's Kentucky bluegrass. That's your lawn. Our lawn basically has root depths of about two to three inches. And you can see our native plant, it's actually, the chart goes down 15 feet. So there is a huge difference between certainly not having any herbaceous layer versus our lawn versus native diversity. All of this is important because one of the, the primary drivers of why invasive species are so harmful to birds is because of that, that loss of that listening of the biodiversity, structural diversity, and ecosystem services. Ecosystems with healthy native plant communities have 22 times more insect species and 23 times more insect biomass than those dominated by invasive species. And so part of this is because when we think about insects um, and also birds, we often think of them in terms of generalists and specialists. But only about 10% of our insects can be considered generalists, meaning that they have the ability to complete their life cycle using multiple plant species of various genera. By eliminating the biodiversity of our plants, we are effectively limiting uh, the biodiversity of our insects. I'm going to touch a bit more on insects and invasives, but if you are interested in this topic and relationship, especially with pollinators and, and other things like that, um, I recommend reading Doug Tallamy's book, Bringing Nature Home. Doug Tallamy is, is actually uh, going to be presenting a webinar next week hosted by the Western York Land Conservancy. So if you're, you're interested in hearing him talk about his new book, uh, you can find information on that at the Rain Conservancy site or at our website, westhandprison.org. So a lot of that, the insect information that I have um, that I'm going to be talking about today comes from the work that Doug Tallamy has done. So I was listening to NPR this week. For those of you who know me, I, I basically am always listening to NPR. But I did hear this story. It was produced by Bird Note. And it fits really well into... Sort of the, the picture that I'm presenting today, and I wanted to share it with you. 
So I'm going to hopefully play this, and hopefully it works. This is Bird Note. A robin tugging an earthworm from the ground is a symbol of spring. But that worm it's eating hasn't always been here. When glaciers pushed south into what is now the U.S., around 20,000 years ago, they scraped off the soil layer and spelled the end of native earthworms, except in the southern states. So that earthworm plucked by the robin is probably a relatively new arrival, most likely a species Europeans conveyed to the Americas in plant soil or in the ballast of ships. So if not earthworms, what were robins feeding their chicks before the Europeans arrived? Well, probably some of the more than a hundred kinds of insects and other invertebrates, as well as berries, that robins are known to eat. Robins prefer to forage in short grass to avoid potential predators, but after the last ice sheets melted back, where was the short grass they liked? One speculation is that prehistoric bison, horses, and mammoths grazed heavily in places, creating robin-friendly landscapes. Just as robins now share pastures with cows, perhaps 15,000 years ago, they hopped among giant bison or woolly mammoths. It's fun to picture, at least. For Bird Note, I'm Mary McCann. So I think this is just you know, really great because I think it more eloquently describes than I could some of the ecological ne- connections between our native landscapes and communities and one of our most common native birds. Um, and it also, you know, shows how much our landscape has changed. I mean, she was talking about glaciers, but even just since uh, European settlement. And also thinking of it in terms of robins as generalists. And so they have the ability to adapt to many different habitats and food sources and they also can cope just as humans quite well. But maybe some of our other species don't necessarily have the same ability to quickly adapt to those other species. As far as the negative impact invasive species have on birds, they kind of follow these basic bullet points. And so uh, they do impact generalists and specialists differently. They do impact all birds. But certainly our specialist species, the species that depend on maybe less common habitat types or uh, more diverse insects or, or food sources, they do impact those specialists more than they do generalists. But there are also impacts on generalists. There really aren't any birds that just kind of get away scot-free when we, when we look at invasive species. It also has to do with all of that habitat stuff I was just talking about, the species composition, the structural diversity. And it comes down to, in many ways, a shift in the types of food that are available for the birds as well as the nutritional value of that food. This is kind of a smattering of very generalist birds as well as some of our more rare and specialized birds that that do uh, live at least part of their life here in western New York. We have the blue jay, uh, the Hensel sparrow, the orchard oriole, purple martin, blackbird and blue warbler, the Cadian flycatcher, and then the beautiful cardinal. Just kind of looking at just this diverse group of birds, you know, like the black sort of blue warbler, it's here during summer in migration, and it's found in deciduous forests and some conifers as well. It likes the heavy undergrowth and partially cleared forests, nests in small trees. They eat primarily insects, but they do also eat seeds and other vegetative matter. The orchid oriole here in the summer likes the scrub, open woodlands, orchards. They use grass in their nests. They eat mostly insects and some fruit. Uh, they also nectar um, as anyone who puts out oranges for the oriole um, is aware. And then we have, you know, the blue jay, which is one of our, it's about as general as you can get. It does eat eat insects, but it also eats other invertebrates, small vertebrates, carrion birds, and it also eats acorns, fruit nuts, and seeds. And cardinals being one of those uh, generalist species as well. Acadian flycatcher is kind of an interesting one. We're at its most northern range, so this was never a very common species here in western New York. But what they've actually shown and researched with this particular bird is that they actually just avoid all areas with invasive species, which unfortunately, since they're kind of running out of options, you know, it's become a bigger issue. And we have the Hensel sparrow. So this is a federally endangered species. It nests in fields and meadows. 
It likes that kind of middle ground, mesic areas, cutting grasses, flowers, scattered shrubs. And they eat spiders, grass, and warm seeds. And just a note about grasslands being one of the more threatened habitat types around the world, the New York State has a lot of grassland birds or, or species that depend on grassland, including the eastern meadowlark, the grasshopper sparrow, and uh, some of those predator birds, such as the short-eared owl and northern terrier. Really, the habitat comes down to you know, where they build their nests in, in their food. Having adequate habitat and food, and in particular insects, the one thing all those species had in common was that they eat insects, that's the bulk of what they eat throughout the year. So when we look at habitat, it's really a combination of habitat loss, habitat degradation. And to kind of give you an idea, in the United States, about 52% of our land is urbanized, about 43% is agricultural, and we have over 4 million miles of paved roads. Over 70% of our eastern forests are gone, and less than 1% of our prairies remain. Of the remaining habitat for specialist birds, and so I'm not really not thinking necessarily of the robins and, and the cardinals, but of those more specialist birds, only about 3 to 5% of that habitat could be considered relatively undisturbed. When we start looking at kind of what is left for our more rare birds, and really all of our, our wildlife, there isn't as much out there as we, as we wish that there would be. And research has also shown a one-to-one ratio. So a loss of 70% of habitat is roughly equal to a loss of 70% of our pollinators, and pollinators being mostly insects, although other species are pollinators as well. So native plant communities, they produce more than four times more biomass and support over three times as many species as invasive species dominated areas. Adding to that, <laughs> so now we have these habitats that are dominated by invasive species that are producing much less benefit for our, our native birds. We also need to add that in areas with high invasive species, you know, particularly like that which is pictured, that kind of understory of invasive shrubs, we see increased nest predation rates and decreased nest success. And just to throw in another contributing factor, the early leaf out of invasive species when compared to our native shrubs tend to essentially trick birds into nesting too early, which can also lead to less successful nesting. So then the question kind of comes up, so we know now that you know birds are eating all of this diversity of, of stuff, but most of our invasive shrubs, such as the honeysuckle and the multiflora rose, we planted those because we thought that those were going to provide habitat and provide food for the birds. Uh, multiflora rose especially was advertised as great wildlife habitat. Well, we were wrong. We were impressively wrong on that. So not only did the invasive shrubs supplant native plant communities and contribute to the decline of insect populations, the nutritional value of that replacement forage is poor. What research has actually shown is that it's just out of sync with the needs of our birds in North America. Our birds need protein in the spring, they need carbs in the summer, they're looking at fats in the fall, and they're looking at carbs and sugar for the winter. And invasive species are kind of producing something else at the time when our birds are in need of those uh, particular resources. So while we look outside and we see the honeysuckle and we see all of the berries on the honeysuckle, and it looks like this great buffet for our birds, you know, and now we know that the birds don't really want the berries to begin with, they'd rather have the insects. But even so, they could eat these berries and still not be getting the nutrition that they need in order to live out their life and, and keep on moving. Just kind of taking a look at some of the more common invasive species that have these impacts on our bird population, we have our invasive shrubs and small trees. So we have the bush honeysuckle, the monocera species, we have the multiflora rose, autumn olive, it's a kind of pretty berry looking thing in the middle of the stream, crimmit and buckthorn. The first thing that I did when I moved into my house was go in the backyard and cut down all of the buckthorn. 
these are shrubs and trees that are just so common on our landscape. I would be confident in telling you that for all of you who, you know, own a home or even, you know, in your apartment, within the landscaping of your apartment, you're, you can go outside and probably not have to take too many steps before you would see one of these species. A privet is very commonly used for hedgerows and very common in buffalo to see hedgerows between houses. And again, like the multiflora rose that was essentially passed out, you know, through different government programs to encourage planting for wildlife purposes. And all of these shrubs have that very similar impact. They're very prolific. They tend to get into forested areas. They spread very quickly and they create a, they say a 100% understory of shrubs. And just to kind of add a little bit of insult to injury, we are responsible for planting these species in our landscape. The birds are actually the primary vector for spreading them once they have established in our natural areas. By going around and spreading the seed and the, and the berries, you know, once it's in our natural areas, it's actually the birds that continue to, to spread these invasive shrubs. Uh, we also have a number of herbaceous plants you know, similar to the shrubs in that they basically form monocultures. And independent of whether one species of bird can actually use this type of habitat, most of our birds cannot use a monoculture of phragmites. You see, the first one that I have up there is cattails. And I know probably everyone's like, oh, but cattails are native. Uh, we do have a native cattail. We have a broadleaf cattail. But more commonly what you're seeing out there are those monoculture stands of the invasive cattail, the narrowleaf cattail, or perhaps even a hybrid cattail that is also invasive. So when we see any of these monocultures of the Phragmites or swallowwort, these are all species that are basically just eating away at those native plant communities that would have supported such a diverse array of species. And so the, the last thing I, I just have to mention, <laughs> so uh, we also have non-plant invasive species to contend with when we're thinking about birds. And when people get mad about outdoor cats, this is why. And yes, birds are, especially our brown nesting birds, are really susceptible to those outdoor cats. Cats are really great hunters. They're really good at it. And so you know, I've already kind of touched on that our brown nesting birds are some of the most imperiled around the world. And we certainly discussed the invasive birds, but also just to kind of point out, even West Nile virus is an invasive species. Viruses can be invasive species. And it wasn't that long ago where West Nile virus was spreading across uh, the country and, you know, we questioned whether or not crows were going to be able to survive. And, you know, thankfully they, they have rebounded. But we have a lot of pressure on uh, birds and, and all, on our wildlife as a result of invasive species. Now we're kind of at the point where, all right, so that was a bunch of doom and gloom. I just spent the last 15 minutes telling you about how everything is stacked up against our birds. So what do we do about it? And so when we think about management, there are many hurdles to clear for management to be successful. Certainly the cost, the training, the time, patience. But I think the biggest hurdle for management, especially with regard to birds and the associated species with birds, is, is that of public opinion. Part of that public perception, it, it doesn't involve kind of a misunderstanding of some of the things that we've already been talking about today, or, or really just not recognizing how catastrophic the impact of invasive species are on birds. You know, we basically are, are looking at an elimination of their food source. Seeing those berries, you're walking outside, you, you see the berries, you see the cardinals, and it's really difficult to sometimes make that connection and understand that what you are seeing is not necessarily what is actually going on. And, and this is a matter of education. But the Migratory Bird Treaty Act also comes up every once in a while by those who are opposed to certain management. But it really doesn't apply in this situation. The NBTA, first of all, only applies to native species. So none of the language applies to an invasive species. I mean, it doesn't apply to an invasive bird species. But 
Invasive species management doesn't inherently violate any aspect of the Migratory Bird Treaty. It doesn't, you know, inherently violate that take order, especially if you're using best management practices, including the use of proper timing. So as long as you are doing your due diligence, doing it to the best of your ability, you don't necessarily need to run into conflict with the Migratory Bird Treaty. On the other hand, there are some legitimate concerns. Birds are using invasive species. They're using them for nests. They are using them for food. Uh, when it's the only thing out there, it's what they're going to be using. And so you do have to adjust your management to address that concern. If your goal is to, to protect birds and to create habitat for birds, you're not going to be doing yourself much favor if you take out what they're currently using in hopes that when you put back what they would rather be using, they'll still be there uh, to use it. With this, that utilization and replacement uh, issue, you know, we still, once again, have the ability and the knowledge to manage in such a way that limits the immediate impact of invasive species removal while still providing for that long-term sustainable benefit of management and restoration. And we do this by using integrated pest management. One of the, the hurdles to invasive species management is that there is no such thing as the silver bullet. There is no simple answer. Implementing some of the management can, can still be easy, but it does require adaptive management strategies. They need to be flexible. You need to rely on multiple methods. There is no single thing that you can do that's going to make a sustainable difference. And you also need to take into account timing and species-specific characteristics. And not just the characteristics of the species you are trying to remove, but you need to take into account the, the characteristics of the species that you're trying to protect. Planning comes into play here. We really need to take the time to, to look at each and every site and develop a plan in order to address invasive species and consider that our desire to protect in this case, birds. And so I'm just throwing this up here because uh, the invasion curve really helps managers identify what type of management methods are available to you. Depending on how much density of a species you have, different tools and different methods are possible. And unfortunately, at this stage, especially when we're looking at those invasive shrubs, uh, we're really looking at that asset-based protection it does limit the types of things that we can do effectively, but we still have the ability to make those plans, but it is long-term management. And so I just wanted to throw this up there. I know it's a lot for those of you who may not have seen it before, but you don't need to remember it. There's no clue. So here are our basic removal methods. We have a manual removal, which is hand pulling digging. Uh, maybe you're just going out and removing seed heads. I also include chainsaws and brush cutters that are manual. Yes, they are power tools, but you're also still only cutting one plant at a time. I think that, that qualifies as manual. Whereas mechanical is more of that mowing, harvesters, kind of heavier equipment. We do have chemical methods as well, pesticides and herbicides. And of course, there, you know, there are biocontrols. We don't have as many biocontrol options as we certainly would like, but they are most often some kind of predator insect. But biocontrols can also be considered pesticides. But on the flip side of that, it's important to understand that management is not just removal of invasive species. Management includes education, it includes prevention, it includes early detection, and in this case it also includes restoration. In western New York, many of our invasive species are just too widespread to expect that removal of a species is really going to allow our native plant communities to reestablish on our own. So we really have to help. <laughs> We've got to get in there and kind of speed that resilience process along. And so restoring native plant communities is essential to protecting our bird population. And then monitoring is really important because again, if you're not working on a landscape scale, we're probably, you know, working on a, a woodlot or uh, maybe, a, you know, if you're lucky, 100 acres um, at a time. And most likely, even if you were to remove all of the honeysuckle from your site, 
there are going to be source populations within a few hundred feet of the property. And so monitoring helps us, and this is where you think back to that invasion curve, where then you have a lot more tools available to you. So you might not be able to go out and manually remove a solid 10 acres of honeysuckle, but you can go out and manually remove seedlings as they start to pop back in after you've done that removal initially. And so monitoring is very important for all of our restoration efforts. And then just a note about the disturbance regime, you know, just let them happen. Don't sweat the, you know, small stuff. You know, your favorite tree falls down. Just know that that's just a part of restoration. That's a part of healthy ecosystems. And you just want to let it happen because it'll be better for it in the long run. What is it that, that you can do as maybe a private landowner to improve habitat for birds? First of all, I encourage you to learn to recognize invasive plants and at the very least, avoid planting them, but also help stop uh, the spreading of that, that seed of the invasive plant. I encourage you to report sightings for INAP invasive. Uh, INAP invasive is a, it's a public database where people can upload information about invasive species locations, um, and it's incredibly helpful for invasive species managers. It gives us a a, a better understanding of where invasive species are in the landscape, it can greatly improve our management abilities and our ability to plan. I encourage you to clean equipment, your mowers especially. Uh, I talked about how the shrubs are, you know, they're primarily spread by birds, uh, but many of our invasive plants are primarily spread by mowers. As people are mowing, they're getting the seed and plant material uh, caught in the base of the mower. And, you know, then you just kind of keep walking in a line and it's dropping the, the seed as you go. So uh, consistent cleaning of mowers is incredibly helpful. If you do have property, whether it's just your backyard or you have a wood lot or you, you have a property where you do timber stand improvement, encourage folks to remove invasive species from those areas. Of course, plant native. It's kind of a callback to the mosquitoes and West Nile virus. It would be great if you change the water in your bird baths to prevent the mosquitoes from breeding. So here are some local suppliers of native plants. Uh, there's a more comprehensive list available on our website, and so I encourage you to take a look at that. For native plants, they can sometimes feel difficult to find in the region. And, you know, there's some truth to that. But I think part of it is that we really need to start asking for native plants. Most nurseries are going to carry what people want. And so if we have more people going out there asking them where the native plant section is, we would start to see more native plants at those places. And it can actually be fun sometimes to go to one of the big box stores and ask the, uh, the garden center attendee where the native plants are, because they usually get a very confused look on their face. For most of these, even these ones that I have up here, uh, they do tend to provide mostly or only uh, native plants. Uh, it's still important to ask, you know, where the plants come from. There have been occasions where I've seen, you know, signs for native plants, and it turns out they're from California, which is great for California, but not so much for New York State. But I also wanted to just point out a few books that may be of interest to folks. A couple of invasive species books. The first from the Michigan Natural Communities. This is a great pocket book that you can get, and I think it's only like 10 bucks, but it has really great pictures of the most common invasive species you're going to find. The second one there is much more in-depth, has really great pictures as well of what's great about the, the guide to ID and impact. It does have the control section, so it gives really great advice on how to manage different invasive species. That particular book was first developed in the Pacific Northwest, so there are a few species in there that we don't have, but I think you'd be surprised when you see how similar the invasive species are in Oregon uh, to New York State. The other two I mentioned, Bringing Nature Home, the great book by Doug Townley that talks a lot about really all of the things that you can do in your own backyard as far as improving habitat, in this case focusing on insects, but as we you know just talked about, it's really those insects and that habitat that then go on to supporting our native bird populations. And the last one is the Birders Handbook. This is not an ID guide, 
Uh, and it even says there isn't a companion to your ID guide. There's no, no color photo. But what's really great about this is pretty much for every single bird, you can look it up and it'll tell you what it eats, uh, what it makes its nest out of, where it builds its nest, the color of its eggs. So it's a really great, it's really interesting read to you just start to see how incredibly diverse our bird populations are. That brings me to the end. And so I'm going to switch over to the chat and see if there are any questions in there. All right, so we have a question. Most effective way to remove bush honeysuckle? Well, you know, in this case, it really depends on how much bush honeysuckle you have. You know, in most cases where it's a very dense stand, I've really found the use of herbicide cut stone treatments to be the most effective. It's a little bit time intensive because you are cutting individual shrubs and then basically painting herbicide on the stem or on that cut stump. But far and away, I found that this is the most effective way to uh, remove established uh, bush honeysuckle uh, populations. Uh, herbicide for the shrub removal or bush honeysuckle removal. I generally recommend kind of a triclopyr. I've had a lot of success with the Pathfinder 2 or uh, Garlon 4, an oil-based herbicide, especially for things like the honeysuckle or the buckthorn. I think you need uh, a little bit better than maybe some of the water-based ones. But for something like multiflora rose, you know, Roundup is fine. Multiflora rose is, is pretty easy. Um, and then it doesn't tend to sprout uh, like some of the common buckthorns do. So piling stems up in brush piles for wildlife, uh, does that benefit birds? There are some birds that would, would benefit from that, and that's, and that's perfectly fine. So it just depends on how much. Because if you're going to be piling things up, um, you might be taking up space on the ground that would otherwise be able to have more herbaceous stuff uh, grow in. So I would, I would say, you know, small piles here and there, diversity is great, and having that stuff kind of in there, just making sure that you're thoughtful about where you're piling them up and that you're not uh, limiting some of the, the native plants to be able to come back. So for, for Japanese knotweed, there's actually a couple of effective ways to deal with knotweed. They are herbicide. Unfortunately, there just isn't a good manual or mechanical method for that's effective for knotweed. But what Western Prison recommends and what I've found to be the most successful is the use of a glyphosate or Roundup, and it, it can be applied in, in a couple of different ways. Stem injection is very effective. And it's very, very time-consuming. So you, that's where you have one of those stem injection needles that you essentially put the herbicide directly into the stem. So it's great for areas near water where you're concerned about that overspray. You can use a stem injection. But the truth is foliar spraying with, with glyphosate is just as effective in the long term. The, the key to that is probably mowing the knotweed ahead of time and making sure that it's only like two and a half feet tall when you're actually spraying it. That way you're using less herbicide, you have less overspray. The plant has been stressed a little bit by the mowing, so the herbicide can be a little bit more effective. But anytime you're dealing with knotweed, it's a multi-year process. There's no single treatment that's going to get rid of it. For IMAP invasive, basically the answer is yes to this question. Uh, you can report that you have an invasive or you can report on different places within the 100 acres. IMAP invasive has, been, has an incredible amount of flexibility and functionality. And so for this, I really would recommend that you do take part in one of the IMAP invasive trainings because they'll show you how you can do just a simple survey and you know, just go out and report the species that are present. Uh, but you can also, they'll also show you how you can take polygons or more detailed records. And you can actually use INAP Invasive to track your treatments as well. So if you wanted to create a management plan for your 100 acres, you would be able to put that data into INAP and just track it over time as far as how successful your treatments have been. So I, I definitely recommend, if you're interested in IMAP Invasive, to take part in uh, one of their trainings. All right. So it looks like that's it for questions. So, again, thank you all so much for joining us today, and I appreciate the questions. And I hope that, it, that you'll be able to join us. We have another presentation next week.
on uh, prevention, on food frustrations, and other things people can do to help stop the spread of invasive species. So thank you, everybody. Have a good day.